Hey everybody, welcome back. Uh, again, this is the ATIT's uh, six study group through Yavapai College. Um, uh, this is the um, first installment of the uh, science portion of the T's. Uh, the, the main meat and potatoes of this is going to be an app fizz. So um, uh, it's pretty in depth. There's a lot of uh, things you got to know. But without further ado, let me just go on to the PowerPoint and we'll go from there. So, okay, practice questions. Again, you see someone walk into the testing center. May the odds be ever in your favor. So science. Um, uh, this, this again is a science portion. Um, I'm going to try to do this in two videos. Uh, we'll see how it goes um, and see uh, what I can do with this because if these are just getting too long, uh, we're just going to have to just beat our heads into a brick wall or something. But I hope that's not the case. I hope we can kind of hang in here and get this going. So moving on. So again, human and at phys, 32 questions. Um, describe gross anatomy, physiology of human, we have to know the respiratory, cardiovascular, gastrointestinal, neuromuscular, reproductive, integumentary, endocrine, genital urinary, immune, and skeletal systems. Um, that seems like a lot. Hopefully we can get through this pretty quickly. Um, uh, again, I'm an anaphys tutor at Yavapai College, and I love it. I, I love helping students understand anaphys. It's, it's something that really um, drives it home for me, and that is what I think is going to one day in the future make me a great nurse. So, moving on. Uh, the gross anatomy and physiology of a human. Um, familiarize yourself with these key terms. The long and short of it is if any of these uh, you're struggling with, I encourage you to reach out and look at the um, resources that are in the introductory and prep um, lecture. That I, that I um, uh, recorded. So the Khan Academy, Crash Course, things like that. Uh, uh, those things will help you if you're struggling with any of these. But with these questions, you need to um, be able to identify basic cell parts, describe the functions of cell parts, uh, no anatomical positions, no anatomical planes, and identify the anatomical directions. So which of the following pairs correctly matches a cellular organelle with its functions? A, Golgi apparatus with protein synthesis. B, smooth endoplasmic reticulum energy production. C, cytoskeleton movement. D, cell membrane storage. Okay, so let's hash this out. The Golgi apparatus is responsible for receiving, modifying, and transporting proteins for secretion from the cell. So it has nothing to do with protein synthesis. A is incorrect. Uh, the smooth ER, um, it lacks the ribosomes for energy production. Uh, so for protein synthesis, it has three main functions, the lipid metabolism, storage of calcium ions, and detox of toxins. So um, it has nothing to do with energy production. B is incorrect. Um, uh, C is the correct answer. The cytoskeleton um, does have, uh, it is part of the movement. It consists of three types of molecules, micromolecules, microfilaments, and intermediate filaments, and they're involved with cell, cell shape, support, and da -da 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 movement. So C is the correct answer. Um, let's, keep, let's, moving on. let's move on to cell membrane. Um, uh, the cell membrane is literally forms the outer perimeter of the cell. Um, it delineates the inside and the outside of the cell. Um, its functions is cellular recognition and transport of molecules. It has nothing to do with storage. So um, moving on. Which of the following describes an anatomical relationship between two structures in the human body? Mouth is anterior to the nose. Ribs are lateral to the sternum. Patella is inferior to the tibia. Muscles are superficial to the skin. Um, so I'm just going to start right off the bat with telling you the correct answer and how these other answers would be made to be correct. 
So option B is correct. The ribs, the ribs right here are lateral to the sternum, this, this middle bone that, that connects your um, true ribs. So the ribs are off to the side, they're lateral to the sternum. So we could also say that the sternum is medial to the ribs, um, if we wanted to put it in different terms. Uh, the mouth um, is not anterior to the nose. The eyes are anterior to the nose. The mouth is inferior to the nose. Um, uh, I'm, I apologize. The mouth is uh, inferior to the nose. The eyes are superior. Um, um, anterior and posterior would be like um, uh, the sternum is anterior to your spine it's in front of. Um, so I guess that that makes more sense. So the mouth is obviously not anterior to the nose. Uh, patella is inferior to the tibia. That's also incorrect. The patella is superior to the tibia. The tibia is this, this the main front part of your uh, lower leg, um, also known as your shin. Um, so the patella is obviously above that, being your, your kneecap, quote unquote. Um, so the patella is superior to the tibia. And muscles are deep to the skin. The skin is superficial to the muscles. So if that were flip-flop, that would be correct. Anyway, moving on. Which of these organs is directly involved in synthesis of red blood cells in adult? Liver, spleen, bone marrow, lymph nodes. Um, the liver is involved in the breakdown of red blood cells, but not the creation of them, not the synthesis of them. The spleen is involved in the breakdown of red blood cells in adults. Again, breakdown, not the creation of. Um, lymph nodes is the filter for the lymphatic system, has nothing to do with red blood cell production. C, bone marrow is the correct answer. Um, that bone marrow is directly involved in the synthesis of red blood cells in an adult, an adult. So moving on. Respiratory system. Again, familiarize yourself with these key terms. If anything that's here you're not quite sure about or what part it plays in the respiratory system, review that Khan Academy, review the crash course, familiarize yourself with it. Understand the, um, uh, the process and the meaning of all of these um, terms. Because with respiratory system questions, you need to be able to identify specific parts of the respiratory system uh, from a list, knowledge of the function of the respiratory system, and knowledge of the relationship between the respiratory and the circulatory systems, how they correlate. So let's move on. At the end of a sprint, a runner breathes hard because the medulla oblongata senses which of the following? Low O2 levels in the blood, low CO2 levels in the blood, the blood becoming more alkaline, or the blood becoming more acidic. So, um, this, um, the medulla oblongata does not uh, sense oxygen levels in the blood. Um, something happens when, um, with the pH, with the arterial blood gas, uh, that changes the um, acidity, the, the pH balance of the blood. And that's what the medulla oblongata senses. So, um, the oxygen levels are not sensed by the medulla oblongata. Um, at the end of a sprint, um, CO2 levels would be high. So low CO2 levels in the blood is not correct. Um, and um, alkalosis indicates low carbon dioxide levels. So C and B are very similar in the sense that the CO2 would be low what happens is the medulla oblongata senses the blood becoming more acidic. Um, uh, carbon dioxide dissolves in the blood to produce uh, hydrogen ions and bicarb ions, increasing the pH and increasing the acidity. Um, and this is what the medulla oblongata senses, and that's when the runner starts to breathe hard during the sprint. Um, which of the following situations would result in increased oxygen diffusion from alveoli into the blood? 
increase in perfusion and decrease in ventilation, increase in oxygen concentration of blood, reduction in alveolar surface area, or reduction in residual volume of the lung. Well, increasing the blood flow must be accompanied in increasing movement of air to provide optimal gas exchange. So um, increase in perfusion, decrease in ventilation is not correct. Um, increased oxygen levels uh, will decrease the gradient between the atmosphere and blood, which is less optimal. So uh, reducing alveolar surface area will reduce diffusion and is not efficient. D is the correct answer, reduction in residual volume of the lung, um, because it will cause a higher respiratory volume and an oxygen gradient. So um, question three, match the following respiratory system effects to their most probable cause. <laughs> I literally took this question right here out of the ATIT study manual. Now, <laughs> I had no <laughs> intention of including this question because of the, uh, the, uh, the, the C word, <laughs> coronavirus. <laughs> I was concerned about adding it, but I put it anyway. So if you want to match the following, if you want to look over this, pause the video, try to figure out which one is which, um, then uh, that's fine. But I'm just going to tell you the answers. A uh, for walking pneumonia is five. Um, walking pneumonia is caused by mycoplasma infection. Mycoplasma is bacteria lacking cell walls. They infect upper and lower respiratory tract cells and replicate within them. Symptoms are mild and include headache and cough, but do not require bed rest, hence the name walking pneumonia. So B, cystic fibrosis is, is matched with three gene mutation. Cystic fibrosis is usually caused by an inherited gene mutation in the chloride transporter in the lung. Due to this disorder, thick mucus accumulates in the lung, causing problems with ventilation and promoting secondary infections. C, common cold, equates to when? Coronavirus. <laughs> Coronaviruses are common viruses that typically cause mild to moderate upper respiratory tract illnesses like the common cold. Now again, that's what the book says. We know that COVID-19 is a lot more serious than that. Uh, D, tuberculosis matches with uh, two, mycobacterium. TB is caused by mycobacterium tuberculosis, which causes lesions in the lung tissues. The bacteria wall themselves inside cavity, the bacteria wall themselves inside cavities inside the lung to protect from immune attack. So that leaves E for mycosis is uh, fungi. Mycosis is a fungal disease. The prefix myco is used in relation to fungus and is applicable to a variety of types of fungi infecting a variety of tissues, including the lungs. Again, sorry about the uh, corona plug there. Look out. Cardiovascular system. Again, I'm, I'm going to beat this like a dead horse. If any of these key terms uh, you're not quite familiar with, I strongly encourage you to familiarize yourself with it. Do some research, do some studying, um, and uh, make sure that you understand what part these all play in the key terms. Because you need to be able to identify specific parts of the cardiovascular system. You need to have the knowledge of the function of the cardiovascular system and be able to trace the blood flow through the cardiovascular system. So from start to finish, figure out where it starts, where it ends. Which of the following describes a property of cardiac cells? A, generation of electrical impulses. B, production of red blood cells. C, immune protection function. D, removal of waste products from the body. So um, again, I'm just going to give you the answers and I'm going to tell you why. Um, so option A is correct. Cardiac cells generate electricity in the sinoatrial node and conduct the impulse through the heart to cause muscle contraction. Red blood cells are produced in bone marrow, not the heart. Cardiac cells do not have immune protection functions. They contract to pump blood around the body. Cardiac cells do not have excretory functions. Excretory functions are performed by kidney necrons, skin sweat glands, and lung alveoli. So the answer is they, they generate their own electrical impulses. And it's super cool when you understand um, how the SA node and the AV node all connect. Um, uh, it, it's awesome. The, the heart is amazing. Um, I can't get enough learning about it. It's super, it's super fun. 
but uh, the answer of this question is A, they generate their own electrical impulses. Uh, which of the following blood component levels would be expected to increase following vaccination? Red blood cells, antibodies, dissolved gases, or leukocytes? And again, I'm just going to give you the answer and we're going to talk about why. Uh, option B is correct. Vaccines increase the body's recognition of the vaccine antigen and antibodies should rise following immunization. Uh, the red blood cells um, should not increase because vaccines do not contain erythropoietin. Dissolved gas levels should not increase due to immunization. That has nothing to do with it. Lymphocytes recognize and respond to antigens. The concentration of leukocytes should remain fairly steady. So that um, leukocytes versus lymphocytes. Um, have to understand that. Which of the following statements regarding the circulatory system is correct? The sinoatrial node is present in the top section of the right atrium. All veins carry deoxygenated blood back to the heart. The heart's lub-dub sound is caused by electrical impulse generation. The heart's atria have thicker walls than ventricles. And again, I'm just going to start with the right answer and we're going to move on. Option A is correct. The SA node is the pacemaker and is situated in the top part of the right atrium. So if you understand the heart with its four chambers, right atrium, left atrium, right ventricle, left ventricle, the SA node is in this top right atrium and that's where it starts and then boom, it just the electrical impulses flow down the heart. Um, the pulmonary vein carries oxygenated blood from the lungs to the heart, so not all veins carry deoxygenated blood back to the heart. Uh, the sound, um, the heart's lub-dub sound is not caused by impulse generation. It's actually caused by the valves opening and closing, the valves between the atria and the ventricles. It, that's what causes it, the lub-dub. Uh, the atria are thinner walled as they receive blood from the veins. Ventricles are thicker walled as they pump blood out through the arteries. So um, we understand that the atria receive the blood and it, as, it's, as they squeeze, they push the blood right down to the ventricles. Well, the right ventricle, when it squeezes, it pushes the blood out to the lungs to, um, to have the gas exchange. It pushes the blood out to the lungs. So the right ventricle doesn't have to be very big because the lungs are the next door neighbors to the heart. It doesn't have to go very far. Now the left ventricle, on the other hand, that has to be so powerful that it, boom, pushes the blood all throughout the rest of the body. So that left ventricle is drastically bigger than the right ventricle, and their ventricles have drastically thicker walls than the atria, because the atria just have to squeeze it right down to the ventricles. They don't have to work very hard to move the blood where they need to go. It's the ventricles that are the real powerhouse, boom, that send that blood where it needs to go. Again, the heart's amazing. It's freaking rad. Okay, gastrointestinal system. Holy crap, this is a huge system. Key terms, pause, familiarize yourself. And again, if you need help, there's uh, additional resources that I've provided. We need to be able to identify specific parts of the gastrointestinal system, demonstrate the knowledge of the functions of the gastrointestinal system, and describe the role of enzymes in the gastrointestinal system. So, oh, which of the following physiological responses follows eating a large meal? The pulse rate increases, peristalsis rate increases, enzyme production decreases, parasympath parasympathetic nervous activity decreases. So again, I'm gonna start with the right answer and I'm gonna explain about the other ones. Uh, B, peristalsis rate increases. Um, peristalsis is the action that, that, that involuntary flexion of the smooth muscle in your GI tract that moves the food through the GI. Um, uh, it, it increases after the food enters the digestive system compared to when there's no food. So the peristalsis rate decreases when there's no food in the system. It just kind of slows down and goes, oh, well, I've got nothing to do, so I'm just gonna hang out. The pulse rate, um, if we understand sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous activity, um, the sympathetic nervous activity is that fight or flight. That's going to increase your breathing. That's going to increase your pulse rate. Um, that's, that's kind of like that, <clears throat> gotta get up and go. The sympathetic nervous system is activated. The parasympathetic nervous system is that rest and digest. 
So those are the things that kind of slow the body down. So if the pulse rate is increasing, something's happening with the sympathetic nervous system that's increasing it. So if you eat a large meal, your parasympathetic system is going to increase, not your sympathetic. Um, enzyme production decreases. Ah, that's wrong. As you're digesting, your enzyme production drastically increases because you need to digest that large meal. Um, and again, that rest and digest, parasympath parasympathetic nervous activity would increase, not decrease. So moving on, which of the following describes why liver failure is a critical health emergency? Liver produces a majority of digestive enzymes. Food is filtered through the liver before digestion takes place. The liver helps digested food products to be pumped around the body. The liver filters digestion products and produces urea as waste. So if we have liver failure, and the liver's not functioning properly, uh, what's the critical health emergency? Well, the correct answer is D. In addition to a lot of other functions that your liver does, it converts um, the, the products and produces urea as waste. So if your liver can't filter the food and can't effectively produce urea, it's just going to sit there. It's not good. So that's the critical health emergency. The liver does not produce um, the majority of digestive enzymes. Food is not filtered through the liver before digestion takes place. Um, and the liver is not involved in pumping food through the body at all. The liver just kind of sits there. It's, it's, it's our filtration system. So when the liver fails, the filtration system starts to fail. And that's not good. Moving on. Uh, neuromuscular system. Uh, again, read through these, familiarize yourself. If there's something that's not clicking, um, uh, there's additional support that you can get. This objective includes identifying specific parts of the neuromuscular system, demonstrating knowledge of the function of the neuromuscular system, and describe how the nervous system controls the muscles. Which of the following actions is controlled by the autonomic nervous system? Walking, chewing, heart beating, talking. Well, option C is correct. The autonomic nervous system consistently and involuntarily tells your heart to beat. With walking, chewing, and talking, those happen because your brain is telling your body to do it. Um, if I take a bite of food, my brain tells my jaw to chew the food. It doesn't just happen automatically. You may not think about it, you know? I mean, like you pop a piece of gum in your mouth, you're gonna chew it. You may not think about it, but your brain is telling your jaw to do it. It's not, um, it's not uh, an autonomic response. Again, with walking and talking, you don't just kind of talk, 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 talk. I mean, some people do, and they really wish that would stop. But, um, it's, it's, a, um, it's a response that your brain tells your tongue and your mouth and um, your, uh, your voice box to do. Uh, walking, you, you get up and you walk. Your brain tells your body which muscles to flex, when and how, and to walk. Which of the following processes best describes how a signal travels across a nerve synapse? Electrical, kinetic, potential, or chemical? Um, and again, excuse me, I'm just going to tell you the answer. Option D is correct. It is a chemical uh, process that describes how a signal travels across a nerve synapse. Electrical is how a signal moves through the nerve cell. Kinetic is a type of energy not really associated with synapse. Uh, potential is a type of energy not associated with the synapse at all. So um, how the signal travels across a nerve synapse is chemical, but uh, electrical is how um, it energy how ener how signals move through nerve cells. So again, that's kind of one of those tricky questions where if you don't read the question properly and understand what they're asking, you're going to answer it incorrectly. What is the primary component of muscles? Fat, protein, carbohydrates, nucleic acid. Well, again, I'm just going to tell you the answer. It's protein. What do bodybuilders eat like crazy? They um, you know, the raw egg thing, oh gosh, it's gross. But the protein shakes, the, the protein bars, um, they're fueling their muscles. Um, 
fat is not the main portion of a uh, component of muscles. Carbohydrates is not, um, and nucleic acid is, um, is, makes up the DNA. Um, so carbohydrates may be an energy source, but that's not the main component of muscles. I hope that kind of makes sense. Um, anyway, moving on. Reproductive system. Um, this also varies from uh, uh, sex to sex, from male to female. So certain um, uh, sexes will have um, parts that others may not. So again, familiarize yourself with these, understand what parts they play, where they are, which gender has them, and, and move on. Because with these reproductive system questions, you need to be able to identify specific parts of the male and female reproductive system. You have to have the knowledge of the function of the reproductive systems, both of them, and the knowledge of the relationship between the reproductive and the endocrine systems, how they, how they um, connect with each other. Which of the following organs produce sperm? Well, we also, we know and understand that females don't pr produce sperm. So we're gonna look for something that females don't have, penis, testes, prostate, vas deferens. Well, these are all male um, reproductive system counterparts, but which one produces sperm? Uh, this is the one we're looking for. Option B is correct. The testes produce the sperm. The penis is just a delivery system. Uh, the prostate is responsible for creating fluid, uh, helping to create seminal fluid to transfer the sperm. And the vas deferens um, are responsible, again, for just sperm movement, moving out of the testes up to make the seminal fluid. Which of the following connects the ovaries and the uterus? So where, what is the so again, let's look at these options. Vagina, cervix, vas deferens, fallopian tubes. Right away, we know vas deferens is not the answer because women don't have vas deferens. If you didn't know that, probably should have checked it. Um, that's okay. If you didn't know it, it's all right. There's always room for improvement. Um, uh, so there's the vagina, the cervix, and the fallopian tubes. And again, D is the correct, I'm just going to give you the correct answer. D, the fallopian tubes. I was always taught that it's the... Um, Karate Kid guy who's standing there, and the fallopian tubes are the, the fimbrae that are holding the ovaries, and your, your body is basically the uterus. So it connects the ovaries to the uterus. Fallopian tubes, yay. Uh, the vagina is the um, birth canal that connects the exterior portion of the body to the interior portion, and the cervix is the opening um, part that connects the vagina to the uh, uterus, it's, it's that, it's the big, the big wall. In which of the following organs is estrogen primarily made? We're looking for organs and estrogen, testicles, uterus, scrotum, ovaries. Um, so estrogen um, is a predominantly female um, generated uh, hormone. So we're gonna be looking for something that has something to do with the female reproductive system. So right away, testicles and scrotum are out of the question. It's gonna be uterus or ovaries. And the, cor the correct answer is D, ovaries. The uterus um, and the uterine lining will have an effect on, um, will have an effect on estrogen production, but the ovaries are the, are, is the primary organ where it's made. So I hope that makes sense. Oh wow, we're cruising through this, yay! Okay, key terms for the integumentary system. Um, again, I'm just gonna, I'm not gonna read these anymore. <laughs> uh, familiarize yourself with them, pause if you need to, read through it, um, make sure you understand them because with these questions, you need to be able to identify specific parts of the integumentary system, demonstrate the knowledge of the function of the integumentary system, and describe the role of the integumentary system in thermoregulation of the body. So which of the following is the outermost layer of skin? Dermis, sudoriferous, sebaceous, epidermis. Um, the correct answer is D, epidermis. It is the epi, most outer layer. The dermis is underneath the epidermis, and sudoriferous and sebaceous are types of glands on the skin. So which of the following is not excreted through the integumentary system? Alcohol, minerals, blood, urea. Um, 
again, I'm just going to give you the right answer. The answer is C, blood. Alcohol, minerals, and urea can all be excreted through the integumentary system. Uh, like when you have a patient who's detoxing from uh, um, being drunk, you can smell the alcohol in their sweat. Um, minerals, uh, like when you're working out or uh, whatever, you can taste the salt. Like if, you're, if a sweat bead drops into your mouth, so you can taste the salt in your sweat. You can taste the minerals that you're just like squeezing out. And again, you can squeeze out the urea with it as well. It's, it's a, it's a uh, um, excretion system. Which of the following mechanism is used when the body becomes too cold? Blood vessel dilation, sweating, blood vessel constriction, vitamin D production. Um, so the correct answer is C, blood vessel constriction. So if the body is too cold, if the body's too cold, it wants to try to keep that heat in. So what happens when blood vessels dilate is they open up more. And that means that it's trying to get as much blood through as quickly as possible. So if the body is cold, we're not going to try to flush a bunch of blood through the system. We want those to constrict and try to kind of keep the heat in as much as possible, kind of slow that, that um, blood movement down a little bit. Um, sweating is not the right answer. That's what happens when our bodies become too hot. Um, we uh, release fluid on our skin to kind of be like an evaporative cooler, like a swamp cooler. Literally, you sweat so that it releases the heat out of your body. And vitamin D production has nothing to do with thermoregulation. It's just, it's neither a cooling nor a warming process. It's just something else the integumentary system does. Okay, endocrine. Uh, again, pause, familiarize yourself with these terms. Um, and uh, let's move on because you need to be able to identify the parts of the endocrine system, the knowledge of the function of the endocrine system, you have to have the knowledge of the relationship between the central nervous system and the endocrine system. So which of the following describes the signal employed by the endocrine system? Electrical, chemical, <laughs> physical, audiovisual. <laughs> some, some of these questions I have to laugh at. It's like, where did you come up with that answer? <laughs> what was going through your brain when you put that answer in a book? Anyway, so um, endocrine system, Option B is correct. We understand that hormones are all about chemical response. Uh, they, may, um, uh, they may be sent off and generate electrical impulses, but they, that's not um, they're, that are employed by the endocrine system. The endocrine system has nothing to do with electrical impulses. It's all chemical. Um, so uh, there's no direct physical connection between an endocrine and its target, except for blood, but that's just a medium. That's just a way of transfer. So um, it's, not, um, it's not physical. That's not the signal that's employed by endocrine system. And audiovisual, uh, yeah, hormones don't produce a sound or a light show. It's just, it's just not what happens. Again, that's like that random, like, what the heck question. Anyway, moving on. So which of the following is not a gland in the endocrine system? The pineal, pancreas, lung, ovary. Uh, the lung. The lung is not a gland in the endocrine system. Uh, the pineal gland, we know, um, this is how I remember it. And um, uh, so when people go to bed at night, they kneel to pray. So pineal Make, helps you get ready for bed for sleep. It produces melatonin, pineal, melatonin, pineal sleep. Um, pancreas uh, produces several important hormones, uh, specifically insulin. Um, and the ovary is a gland that, is, that produces estrogen. Um, I don't know, it's, it's, it's lung. See, that's, the, that's not a gland in the endocrine system. Genitourinary. So we need to have an understanding of, of a lot going on here. Genitourinary is a really kind of complex system. Um, Crash Course on YouTube has fantastic, fantastic lectures about um, how the genitourinary system works specifically with the pressures that need to be involved. Um, so again, pause the slide, familiarize yourself with these key terms. 
um, because with these upcoming questions, we need to know the specific parts of the genital urinary system, the function of the genital urinary system, and the relationship between the cardiovascular and the genital urinary system. Oh my gosh, guys, we're cruising through this. Yay! Okay, which of the following organs functions as part of the genital urinary system to maintain blood pressure? We're looking for the, the um, organ that maintains blood pressure, heart, kidneys, bladder, ureter. Um, so it's, it's the kidneys, guys. Uh, the kidneys is the, is the main organ that functions as, the, as maintaining the blood pressure. Uh, the heart is part of the cardiovascular system, but it has no say of maintaining blood pressure. Uh, the urinary bladder, again, doesn't maintain blood pressure. It is just a bladder. It just collects urine. That's all it does. That's its only purpose. And the ureter, um, those are the tubes that come down from the kidneys to the bladder. So they, they have no say in maintaining blood pressure at all either. They're just a, they're a tube. Which of the following parts of the genital urinary system also transport sperm? Kidney, ureter, urinary bladder, urethra. The correct answer is D, urethra. Urethra is um, not necessarily a two-way street, but it's a, uh, it has a dual purpose, dual functions. <laughs> you uh, males can either urinate out of it or they can ejaculate out of it. It's interesting. Uh, it's not the kidney. Kidneys don't have anything to do with sperm transport. Ureters, again, are the connecting tube from the kidney to the bladder. And the bladder, again, is just a, is a collection vessel for urine. So um, it's D, urethra. Which of the following organs filters blood and creates urine? Heart, bladder, lungs, kidney. Um, and the correct answer is D, kidney. Uh, the heart pumps the blood. The bladder stores the urine. The lungs um, oxygenate the blood and, and um, are, are involved in the uh, respiratory system. Uh, the kidney filters blood and creates urine. That's what it's supposed to do. So moving on, the immune system. Um, another, another big system to understand. Um, and the really kind of crappy part about the ATITs is that, yeah, you have to know so much of all of these. Um, you have to know so much, 32 questions to be exact. And that's a lot of information to study for only 32 questions. But I can guarantee you, if you really heavily familiarize yourself with, with the body system, it's going to make nursing school a lot easier. So um, for uh, the intents and purposes of the T's study group, just go ahead, pause the video, familiarize yourself with these key terms because um, you need to know the specific parts of the immune system, the knowledge of the function, and the relationship between the immune system and all the other systems, because they all tie together. Which of the following are innate immune system cells that attack host cells harboring an intracellular pathogen? Natural killer cells, cytotoxic T cells, plasma cells, dendritic cells. <clears throat> Give me a moment while I take a break and get a drink of water. Sorry guys, I am like dying today. Again, like I said before, my husband and my kids are, are out of town. So I'm trying to get as many of these recorded in the peace and quiet as I possibly can. So um, again, I'm just gonna give you the answer. Option A is correct. Class means breakdown. Osteo, oh, I'm sorry, my bad. I'm reading the wrong part. Option A is correct. Natural killer cells sample and attack host cells that harbor intracellular pathogens. Cytotoxic T cells are a part of the adaptive immune system, not the innate immune system. Plasma cells are antibody secreting cells and do not attack host cells with intracellular pathogens. Dendritic cells are a type of antigen presenting cell and do not attack host cells. So when I was going through an at -phys, um, and we're learning about the, uh, the um, immune response with the natural killer cells, I literally thought of like a hitman. 
<laughs> that's what's what I thought of is like these are born trained killers like they know their target and they're just gonna go for it and they come in they silently just like boop kill it call it good and it's done so uh, it was just kind of fun to think about so natural killer cells are the innate system cells that attack host cells harboring an intracellular pathogen which of the following is a non-specific immune response antibody secretion by plasma cells, cytokine secretion by T cells, antigen recognition by B cells, and cytokine mediated inflammation. And op it, the option D is the correct answer. Inflammation mediated by cytokines, it's a nonspecific response to an injury. So um, I cut my finger before my finger even realizes that there is put, there's an infection, it's gonna swell at that site. It's going to try to shut off incoming and outgoing um, with just sending this inflammation response. Um, so uh, plasma cells are adaptive immune system B cells that have been activated to secrete antibodies. T cells are adaptive immune system cells that are activated by antigen presenting cells. And antigen recognition by the adaptive immune system's B cells is a specific response to an antigen. So all the other options are specific responses. Um, so understanding the specific to non-specific, innate to adaptive, that's really important with the immune system. Last but not least, the skeletal system. Um, again, familiarize yourself with these um, and uh, let's move on to the questions because we need to identify the parts of the skeletal system know the function of the skeletal system, and know the relationship between the skeletal system and the neuromuscular system, how those two tie together. Which of the following cells is involved in mineral resorption from bone? Osteoclasts, osteoblasts, canaliculi, or an osteon? Um, option A is correct. Clasts means breakdown. Osteoclasts solubilize bone with, with acid secretion and cause minerals to be resorbed from bone in response to hormonal signals. Osteoblasts make bone by laying down collagen matrix followed by the osteon. Canaliculi are small canals in the bone which osteocytes communicate with each other. And an osteon is the hydroxypite uh, matrix the osteoblasts produce. So moving on. <laughs> Which of the following bones articulate at a synovial joint? Skull, radius, and ulna, bones of the pubis, humerus, and scapula. So option D is correct. The ball and socket joint of the shoulder is a synovial joint. The skull bones are fused together with sutures, and we really don't want those moving around a whole lot. Uh, the radius and ulna, actually, they don't even move together. Um, they move against, they, they don't move against each other. They're just, they're, they're connected, but they're not. I don't know if that makes sense. And again, the, um, uh, the pubic bones are fused with cartilage, and they don't contain synovial joints. We don't want those bones moving around a whole lot. Um, so it's important that they, uh, they um, stick together with that cartilage. So, holy cow! That was so much faster than the last lecture. Oh, I'm so glad I'm re-recording these. Hey, well, thank you so much for joining me for the anatomy physiology portion of this. Um, again, I can't stress enough how important it is to familiarize yourself with a net phys. If you're struggling with it, um, uh, it's it's got to be an area you work on because as as a nurse, um, it's something that you're always going to use and it's something you're always going to fall back on. So I, I really, really strongly encourage you to, um, to get stronger with it. Um, uh, it's, it's, it's really important, and I think it will help specifically a lot with med surge, because med surge is not just understanding the anat phys, but it's also the pathophysiology of what can go wrong. So um, anyway, I hope it helped, and let's see how many more recordings I can get done this evening. But thanks for joining me for this one. Uh, I hope you guys uh, have a great night and see you later.